Hi, guys, and welcome back to the podcast once again. Today, of course, is my one and only guest. But when you have a guest like her, you only need one. <laughs> it because... Sort of like having three guests at one time. <laughs> Even though I don't get to talk that much, Kevin. It's okay. <laughs> I just have a hard time doing one of these podcasts because I keep looking at myself in the mirror. And I, Jesus, nobody loves you more than you do, Kevin. I, I know. we all know that. We, you know, it's like that dog, remember, in yeah. that uh, cartoon when he used to float up in the air and come down. We have to eat the biscuit. What was that? Yeah, yeah. After he <laughs> ate the biscuit. We, yeah. we, all right, let's stop getting. Yeah. <laughs> what was his name? Now it was the evil, the evil guy. That had an evil dog that would prostitute himself for a bone of a stick, and he'd take the bone and then he'd float up and come. Ah. And he'd wrap him. He'd hug himself first. It remember? Does not no way in hell reflect anything about me. I don't like no, bone. no, no, no. Okay, so anyway, today we're back again with um the other part. Spinchy, yeah. Remember who I am? Yeah. Yeah, I see a friend. Friend. We know each other well enough now that we shouldn't be on a last name basis. Fran. I used to call her Mrs. Masucci. Masucci. Is that say, am I doing it right? And yeah, now you're doing it right. It took you long enough. Masucci. Jeez. What the fuck, Masucci? We're going to have to get you hooked on phonics. Yeah, hooked on phonics. That's the big <laughs> end. I mentioned my head looks so. Anyway. Oh, anyway God. Today we're going to be talking about the other murderer, the other. The other half of this, this is just so mind blowing. Like again, I've met a lot of murderers in prison. I've met a, met a lot of murderers on the street. I put a lot of murderers behind bars where they belong. I did all of those things, and some of them were gruesome murders: five-year-old boy decapitated, all kinds of. This guy, especially the brother, is the worst. You are the worst, and he's still alive. And he's looking at this. I know you. I see you, Jojo. I see you. Come on my podcast and let's talk about it. Let's get your half. There's two halves to every story. Let's get yours if you got one. I don't think you can. What are you going to do? Call him a liar? 16-year-old kid. They don't lie. Not about something like this. But this guy was the worst of the worst. I can't imagine. Murdering your own father. I mean, if this isn't a feature film, I don't know what is. I mean, this got all the earmarks of being a $50 million theatrical feature film. And who would know better than me? I've had my life optioned, I don't know how many times, by Hollywood. Um, and now there's another part of this story that has to do with this mutt, the uncle, who's long dead. How long has he been dead, Fran? I don't really know when he died because I was in Florida when he died, but it was over 10 years ago. That's for sure. He's been, he's been, he's been cooking in hell for the last 10 years. That's where he is. And that's where, uh, well, he's burning with the best of them. Um, there's one part of this story that will tell beyond a shadow of a doubt beyond a reasonable doubt, even, I think, that he did it with his nephew. This is the uncle. What was his name? Carmen. Carmen what? Misucci. Say it like you mean it. Carmen Misucci. Nucci. Uncle Nucci. Go like this with your fingers, whatever that means. Does that mean Italians are hungry? They go I don't like know. This. I don't do this. Oh, I don't do God, this. But you're half Irish. That. I don't do that. And I do head. this. Futura. But that's it. What does this mean? This I could care less. Okay. Oh, like oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love Italians. I really do. It's just so funny. Anyway, uh, so there's this one thing that he did. His friend's going to tell the story. You can tell it better than I. Where he actually admits that not only is he dead, that he's dismembered. And that he's in a river, a bay. What is it? What was it called? Sheepshead Bay? Mm -hmm. What he said? Yeah. yeah. Of course, he didn't get the real address because only only one person that knew where I put that was me 
and this other guy, Minsky, and Joey Bikini, he, he, he would know. He would know. All right, friend, why don't we what, talk about your uncle? What kind of uncle was he when you were a little girl? What kind of uncle was he? What kind of uncle was he? Let's talk about his background. Because he's dead now. I can't offer him to get his side of the story because he's 10 years dead. Not in hell. So he would come to our house uh, with the ribbons uh, sometimes when my father well, would be doing to the, Explain to the audience what that means. Ribbons. The um, adding machine tapes, when you add up all the uh, numbers, uh, they're long. They go all over the place because they don't, you don't cut them off. You just keep going. You keep running them. So they, they look like ribbons on the floor. It has to do with the oh, betting and, and how much money. Right. That's what, the winnings. The winnings. My father would have to do the winnings. He never let anybody else do that. Yeah. yeah. This is the payout. Right, the payouts. Right. Right. Which was thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. So. Nochi would come, Georgie would come. Those are the only two people that were allowed in my house when the winnings, they would pick them up and they would deliver them to wherever, uh, probably by, um, Jimmy Knapp's place, okay? My father never did anything himself. He always had them do stuff for him. So he would come and he would have coffee and stuff. And, you know, we would always see him at functions. I mean, he was always with my Aunt Rose and who I loved very much, my Aunt Rose, very, very, very sweet woman, beautiful lady. And, and she is what? Your father's sister? She was my father's sister-in-law, which was Nochi's wife, oh, okay. my Aunt Rose. Yeah, beautiful woman, inside and out. Um, oh, oh, one of my favorite aunts. So anyway, um, and her kids, Lynn and, you know, they're Janet and, and Gary, I love them very much. I mean, they have nothing to do with this, nothing. Uh, my uncle's relationship with my father was uh, a little tense. Okay. I guess he was a little jealous. He acted a little jealous at times when he would talk to my father, much like my brother would talk to my father. They, they kind of like had a condescending attitude. Jealous people. Oh. Let, me, let me stop you right there. Jealous, jealous. Why? In case you guys haven't saw the other videos, which you got to do, because this is not going to make no sense unless you watch the other ones. This man was making $104 million cash a year. That would be the equivalent of 2023 money of $658 million, over a half a billion dollars of cold, hard cash. This was, he, he had to have been the highest earner at that time for the Genovese crime family. No. I mean, had to be. I mean, we're who, just finding who, this who out. Who higher than him? Who? Who? Not the chin. That's for sure. I don't think the chin was, and that was his boss. I think. Who, no, who wasn't his boss at the if anybody out there knows who was the highest earner in the early to mid seventies in the mafia, Genovese family, please leave a comment in the section below because I want to know who that guy is. Good friend. So Uncle Carmen was um, kind of quiet, kind of quiet. Um, my father was very quiet as well. Um, he uh, he always said he was going to do stuff for me, but he never did it. And that he never kept his word with me. And one day we went to Atlantic City uh, after my father disappeared. And he treated me for a whole day, you know, in Atlantic City, like he would his own daughter's. And I felt I felt that he felt guilty about something because when we were having dinner and he was gambling, he was gambling heavy, heavy. And and Nucci didn't have that kind of money. He had it after my father died because what kind of money are we talking about? And when you say heavy, I'm, he was betting a thousand dollars every time we were on the crap table. And how long and was he on the crap table? How long was he there? Maybe two hours. And uh, he was trying to teach me the game of craps okay. because. I know who got about gambling. My father taught us never to gamble. He said it was a sickness and that that's how we were making our money. Unfortunately, these people are sick. And he said, you're never going to be like that. So don't even think about gambling. So I, you know, when I go to Atlantic city, I don't gamble craps. My father used to play, uh, what is that? Uh, Baccarat, uh, different end craps. So uncle Nucci was trying to teach me craps. And I was like, 
Oh, I don't. 17? You were 17 at the time? Well, yeah, 17 or 18 years old. Yeah. And I was like, I don't have this kind of money anyway to gamble anymore. I mean, even if I did, I don't have it. Like, I didn't have any money coming in. That's odd. But it treated me to, uh, we went to resorts and we had a nice Italian dinner and we spent the whole day together. Um, because after my father disappeared, I was hanging around with Sonny DeSimon at Sonny DeSimon's uh, place uh, because that was our car wash and, and auto body fender. We were partners with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't give up the money after all, after he was supposed to. And Nucci would be there, Dr. Feldman. We would all hang out there. And uh, Joe Corey was another guy. He owned Corey Warehouses. So I was hanging around with all these guys for a long time afterwards. Because not only did I want to know what happened, but I wanted to get their personalities. I wanted to know what was going and on. And so what, what about the money? There was no money from the... So your brother took over... The, the bookie business when your father went? No, this, no, my that? brother thought that he was going to take the and bookie. And then how, how did that Nicole go? Colucci. Well, I don't know what happened between them, but suddenly my brother was out. And they after he, he after he beat me up, we didn't talk. My mother threw him out of the house. And that's how I got the gun because I knew he was going to take the gun and I hid it on him. He took all of his guns but he didn't take that one because he did. He was in a hurry to get out of the house. My mm. mother threw him out. He was getting married and he beat the shit out of me. He broke his hand on my head. So he went up the aisle with a broken hand. So I didn't really participate in all the reindeer games at the wedding. I hung back uh, with my boyfriend. Wait and when they after, after your brother beat you up, you, you still attended his wedding? I didn't want to. I didn't want to, but my my uh, my sister in law said that she didn't want to make a scene. And how did you fake? Did he mess up your face? No, it was my head. It was my head. My head was in bad shape. But they didn't get married until like the following year, and it was right before right before they got married that he started this uh, and beat the shit out of me. So my mother threw him out of the house, and he didn't really have much time to get out of the house. So what he did was he took some of the locks off the doors. He took the plates off the cars so we couldn't drive them. Uh, it was a real, real problem. It was a problem. We called this chief of police, Chet Potter, to, to help us. And he said, no, I can't help you because Joey said that um, your uh, daughter's a heroin addict and we're not getting involved with all that bullshit. Really? I, I mean, I was in West Hudson Hospital uh, getting x-rayed. And uh, we wanted to mess up your credibility so no one would speak to you. But let's get back. Let's get back to the uncle. I want to know more about the uncle. The, uh, well, there wasn't really much time that I would spend with him before he, but, but uh, was he before normal? my father. I'm just trying to picture because um, I, I knew a guy that married a woman for money and he murdered her. He murdered her friend and he decapitated her friend's five-year-old um, son. So I know a guy like that. But what kind of guy? No, 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 no. This, this isn't this isn't a blatant murder like that. No, I, I don't. No, no, no. Yes, well, well I mean, what, the story that you're going to tell about Sheeps at Bay, it makes him a murderer in my book. How did he know that? I mean, the, the right. idea that you would say that to a grieving widow is, uh, were you there when he said that? No, I was not. My mother came home distraught. Okay. The, the idea of somebody murdering their own brother uh, with their his sons, I mean, it, it's just un... What word am I looking for? Unfathomable? For even my wild imagination to compute this. It, it is... It is the, the worst murderer I've ever been involved with, you know, and again, again, Jojo, you're welcome to come on and take your, uh, put your two ends and confront your sister. We can do a three-way on you. Again, let's do that. But what this man said, and we're going to get there in the, now, we're going to get there right now. What he said to a grieving widow that, what was this, like a year after? How long after did he say this? About uh, nine months later, okay. we didn't have any money coming in after after this happened. Okay, 
And my mother was going through the money that we had in the safety deposit box. And when she went there and we didn't have much money left, she came home and she said to me, there's only $10,000. I, I don't know what to do. So I was like, what are you talking about? So she said, you know what? I'm going to go down to the diner and I'm going to get some money for us because um, I was I know. from the diner. So what happened was my father squashed a, a hit on somebody that owed a lot of money. It happened to be a cousin of mine, actually. We found that out later. The guy gambled a lot of money and DeGilio wanted to kill him. So DeGilio, my father had to sit down with him and their family, and my father put a, a quash on the hit. So in return, his grandfather had to pay my father $100 a week. So he paid them this $100 a week, and he would leave it at cash down yeah. at this diner across the street on Newark Avenue uh, okay. from Sunny to Simons. Gotcha. So my mother said, I'm going to go get the hundred bucks at least would have that for food and stuff, you know? So she went down to the diner and my uncle knew she was there. And he said to her, what the fuck are you doing here? And she said, I came to get the hundred dollars that Nikki, you know, gets. He said, get the fuck out of here. I'm giving that to my son, Gary. This is out. You're out. And she goes, uh, but I don't have any money coming in. And he goes, she said, you know, uh, Nikki's going to be so mad when he comes back. He said, Nikki ain't coming back. Wow. Nikki, Nikki ain't coming back. They chopped Nikki up and they put him in Sheep's Head Bay. You're never going to hear from him again. And my mother said that she was shaking so badly that she, when she went out to, to uh, cross the street, the Newark Avenue bus almost hit her. She said she got in her car and she cried for over an hour. She couldn't even drive the car. Now, my mother had open heart surgery. She had a fake valve in her heart. This was her second heart operation. I mean, I just cannot fathom anybody that knows my mother since she's 18 years old. They knew each other when they were kids. My father dated her for seven years before they got married. How can he blatantly say that to her and not give her any money at all? And if it's one thing I've learned about murderers throughout my life is that they all have one thing in common. And that one thing in common is they are all without conscience. They have no conscience. They can commit murder and just eat a bologna sandwich after them. Like it was like, like you would like you or I would put our shoes on. That's what they have in common. But this guy talking to his sister-in-law Telling her that he's chopped up, which is exactly what Salvatore Vitali said, is just unbearable. Look at her, everybody. Look, look. Un this is so unbelievable, and it's shocking that this hasn't come out publicly in forty year, forty nine years, one month. It's been. You okay, he friend? Was dead enough that they murdered him, but they did chop him up. They had to chop him up. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just unfathomable. And and they should have killed me. They should have killed me because I'm the one who's being tortured. He he. They would have tortured him more if he if they killed me because it would have killed him. Yeah. So instead, they killed me. They killed my life. They took him away from me. My mother and I struggled for, I had to work three jobs to take care of her and, until, until and I really so owned you're still working to this day. You're running and I am, I'm still working to this day. She's running the business. She runs around like a chicken with her head cut off. Every time I, we try to talk, she's got to go here and zoom off there and pick this one up, drop that one off. I mean, and I don't want to give your age away, but uh, Fran ain't no spring chicken. I mean, you know, I mean, you can figure it out. If she was 16, in 74, you figure out how old she is today. And for her to be li living the way she did while well, those two months, I mean, so for this guy, what do you say, nine months after, to tell his sister-in-law that she's never come, he's never coming back and that he's chopped a bunch of piece, pieces in, in the river somewhere. And and then that's what it looks like happened some 49 years later. We, we this is this story is just 
absolutely mind blown. You okay, friend? Sorry. Yeah. I mean, look, what, look, I mean, this is 49 years old. The pain never went away. I mean, I lost my mom. I lost my dad. I lost a lot of people close to me. I'm almost 70 years old. You, you know, they all, thank God, went naturally. God was the one that took them. Let's put it that way. Nobody has the right to take anybody's life. That's God's job. And, um, so I want to tell you what happened afterwards. I told my mother to get dressed a couple of days later. I just couldn't take when this. Your mother, I, I, after your mother came back from the diner, did she tell you right away what, what your uncle said? Yeah, she told me that day. Yeah. And, what, and what, what did she think about what he said? Did she believe it? Did, did she then realize nine months later, it's now 1975, he's dead. He's not hiding from the police. He's not hiding that he's dead. And not only is he dead, he's dismembered. Did she come? Did she, she was pretty, pretty upset. And when she told me I lost it, I lost my, I lost it. I can't even tell you. It was hysterical. So nine uh, months after I had you a been missing, you, this is the first realization right. that he's, yeah. he's, on not the coming back. he's not coming back. So it took me a couple of days to get my head together because I was a mess. And I said to her, one morning I was supposed to, I don't know, do something else. I said to her, get dressed. She goes, where are we going? I go, we're going to go to Jimmy Knapp's house. We're going to Uncle Jimmy's house. Now, mind you, my brother never called Jimmy, Jimmy Knapp, James Napoli, never yeah. called him Uncle Jimmy. I always did because we were close. We well, were the other thing, I be, I'm guessing nobody liked your brother growing up. I mean, if your fa own father and mother didn't like him and he was beating you up. I and mean, the nobody... girlfriend didn't like him either. She told me she hated his guts, that he threatened her afterwards. It was crazy what he did to her. So I like yeah, to speak to the girlfriend too. If the girlfriend's uh, alive. Probably dead by now. She was in her late eighties when I spoke to her and I don't think she lives there. I know her husband had passed away. I got her right in the nick of time. Believe me, I, I took her out for the day. I flew to Florida to meet her. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, I spent the, the whole entire day and night with her. So um, I told my mother to get dressed. We were going to Uncle Jimmy's house. I went to Uncle Jimmy's house. By the way, my brother had told me originally that the car was found just right by Uncle Jimmy's house, which it was not. I found that out later. Where was Uncle I, Jimmy? Where did he live? Which downtown, uh, third, second or third, or first, second or third, like uh, wait, wait, downtown. The car was found on 23rd. Wait, 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 uh, first, second or third, what? Street or Avenue? Yeah, street. Um, in, in, in Manhattan. So that's Alphabet City down there. The, yeah, it was, he lived street. in Brownstone down, down on, uh, I think it was 3rd third, third third Avenue. Street. Okay. Yeah. Well, third I Avenue. can't really remember right, right now. Okay. Anyway, what happened is we went there. The camera looked at me. I said, uh, you know, I'm here. Fran Masucci, can you open the door? The maid said, he's not home. We don't know you. Blah, blah, blah. I said, turn the camera to my face and tell me that you don't know who I am. And he opened the door himself. And he said, baby, what are you doing here? And I said, what are we, <laughs> what are we doing here? Come on, stop it. And I just walked into his house. Now I was never in his house before. My mother was, but I wasn't. I just like walked right past him. So we sat down. He said, let me get your coffee. The maid came down. Jeannie came down. Everybody, you know, we're all together. And I told him, I said, we don't have any money. And he goes, what do you mean you don't have any money? Where is all the money? Like, Where is all the money? I go, um, well, my brother took it. I said, and he said he came here three times to confront you about what happened. He said, your brother never came here. I said, my brother never came here. He said, absolutely not. If Joey came here, I would have talked to him. Jojo, Jojo, you need to clean this up. You need to come on the show, but you need to clean this up. This is making you look very, very bad. Uh, so then I said to him, well, why don't you think that you have talked to my father? He said, because Nucci told me that he's in Florida and he's still sick. He's still in the hospital. I said, what? He came home in September. Didn't he come to the to the meeting? He goes, he came to the meeting and he went back in the hospital. He went back to Florida to the hospital. 
I said, no, he didn't. He never came. He hasn't come home. We haven't talked to him. So that's the story he gave him. Right. That's the story he gave me. So I was no, no, watching. That's the story your brother right. gave Nucci, his brother, my right, yes. Uncle Nucci gave Car right. uh, him because Uncle Nucci used to take care of the business while my father was away. Okay. okay. So I said to him, Joe and Uncle Nucci said that they were going to take over the business. And he was like, take over the business. Nucci can't shine your father's shoes. I don't want to give it to him. So now at this point, I'm totally confused because he seemed very genuine when he said this to me. And I was staring at him so diligently. My mother said that he was squirming, like he he was started like moving around, you know, like this. She said, he, he, he never squirms. So then he said to me, he came up close and he said to me, what are you looking at? I said, I can look at you any way I want. I know you since I'm an infant. I said, when my father wrote this paper, he told me if he had any debts that you would clear them up for me. And there's a whole bunch of people on this paper that we could collect money from. And I need some money now. He goes, well, are you going to go to college? I said, how am I going to go to college? There's no money for college. It's gone. So he said, you just hang on. He got on the phone. He went outside. He took the phone outside in the garden. He came back in and he had indictments up to his waist. He said, I have to go through all these depositions. He goes, there's problem. You know, we have problems right now. He goes, but tomorrow you pick up the phone and listen to the instructions. Of course, don't talk on the phone, which we never did. He said, and just follow the instructions. So the next day this happened. I got the phone call exactly at 11 o'clock. I was told what to do. My mother was crying, begging me not to do it. Uh, which, okay. which was what? What did he I had to go. I had to go to a restaurant and collect the money, my first payment. Okay. So they decided. We sat down and we decided how many payments, how many years, and how this was going to go. I had to go to the restaurant and do this. So I went by myself, and I did this. And my mother was hysterical, thinking I wasn't going to. And home. you were what seventeen this time? Maybe eighteen. Okay. Uh, maybe yeah, seventeen, eighteen, okay. uh, probably seventeen. Yeah, I wasn't eighteen yet. So we, I went down there and we worked it out. How were we going to do this? And I went down there every week religiously. My friends came with me. I'd always bring somebody with me. The first time I brought somebody with me, I had my father's gun in the glove compartment of my car. And I said to her, do you know how to shoot a gun? And she said, no. I said, if I don't come out of here in 15 minutes, somebody comes up to this door, just take this gun, hold it in both your hands and shoot them right in the face. I said, and drive away. She's like, what? I said, oh, put your big panties on. Will you put your big panties on? You got to do this for me. All right, what was, your, what was the first payment? How much was it did you collect the first time? The first time I collected uh, $275 or 300 bucks, something like that. Okay. And how so, often were you going to book the going... Once a week, I would go once a week, but then it increased as I went on. The money increased as I, I went on. So they owed us about $100,000. So it, it was in payments. So my mother could use the money for, you know, the house payments. Because if we get, she wasn't used to um, being on a budget of any kind. So I, I thought it would be best if we just gave her little increments because she'd spend all of it. Because she wasn't used to, you know, she didn't know anything about money. My mother was so green. You have no idea. She was well, so let, sweet. Let me make a comparison, Ken. So I didn't get uh, into great details with my friend's daughter, Jackie Bikini. I wanted right. to speak to her over an hour. And I asked her, how did she get by after her father was murdered by Roy DeMail? And she said, we did because we're strong and um, very private person, girl, woman. Um, she was born in 1969. And um, she said they struggled. They went from, you know, in the mafia, I'm guessing, 
You know, I never was in the mafia, but I worked for the mafia. Um, when the breadwinner goes, a lot of these guys don't do the right thing. And she wasn't taken care of either. And um, I spoke to Fran about this. And I, I want Fran to call Jackie because her father's in this with that the Mayo. So it could very well be, we know for a fact that Roy DeMayo murdered Joey Bikini in 1976 in May. We, we know that now, we know it. And now all of a sudden there's a Roy DeMayo connection with this case. So I may have been talking to two of these mafia guys. I mean, this, is, this, this, this whole story just won't stop growing, branching out, branching out. So um, we spoke about this before. Um, I'm thinking this week, um, I want you to give Jackie a call. I'm going to give you a number. And just, you know, you guys got plenty in common. You're only 10 years apart in age. You, you're... Um, you know, where she was able to put her dad to rest. You're, you, you, you haven't. You're not. You didn't get that. But we're going back in six months, and we're going to tear that, what's left of that car apart until we find something. All right. Oh, go ahead, Fred. So at that point, uh, I was, you know, collecting money on my own. Uh, had nothing to do with Uncle Nucci at all. Had nothing to do with anybody this else. Bit, this is what, 300 bucks a week? Yeah, five, 500. Well, I guess you could get by in 74 with 300, right? You were getting by with that? Like five, 500. Plus I was working three jobs. So I was taking care of the house and my mom. Mm -hmm. and, and the money that she had was for her. She yeah. would spend it on food. Like my mother didn't really do anything at that point. Uh, she yeah. didn't have a car payment. We didn't have pay. The house was paid for. Uh, you know, we had the gas and electric bill, which was astronomical. Back then, it was $300. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, the gas and electric bill was 300 back then? We had a big house. Yeah. yeah we lived in a big house. So, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, that money was for her. I didn't take that money from her. I would give it to her. That was for her. Listen, this woman went through heartache. Like, you don't even know. I mean, I can't imagine... But my her brother in law telling her he's not ever coming through that door again. He's chopped up in a bunch of pieces. He's in the river, and and that's looks that's the way it looks like right now. I mean, he got the what did he say? What, what part of Brooklyn? he said? Shit, that bay. He said bay. How far is that from 59th Street Bridge? I don't know. It's not that far. It ain't that far. And he put, so he admitted knowing where the body was and that it was chopped up. Then but, you're guilty of you're guilty. Well, the problem is, is that nobody from the family knew this at all for over a year. We weren't allowed. He told us that day with my brother, we were not allowed to tell anybody that he was missing. No one. So why? Why couldn't we tell them? My mother wanted to have a mass for him when we found out that he was dead. She wanted to call the family together and have a mass. We couldn't do. We weren't allowed to tell them. So we had to live with this shit That's in our soul, in our soul, because we were petrified. We were petrified. We didn't know what the fuck to do. We didn't know if the FBI was going to come after us and take the house away from us. It was just her and I at that point. I didn't know what to do. I did whatever I needed to do to make money, whatever. I did private investigations at night. I worked in Manhattan uh, as a designer. Joe Corey got me the job in uh, Lexington Avenue. And then I worked in the D&D building. I, I worked day and night all the time, all the time. I still do. You know that. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to take care of her. And until the day she died, she died in my arms. I gave her CPR. She, I was holding her in my arms as she died. And I said to her, what am I going to do without you? And she said to me, you do too much. And she died right in my arms. Wow, what a story! Oh. I mean, I'm just so I'm I'm just so blown away. Now we have to wait another six months to go back to the car and search it. 
I mean, a lot of people have commented, well, you, you weren't, you were only at the car for like 10 minutes, but everybody's got to understand that it, it was the last day the divers were available. And it was the last 10 minutes of a window. You have a window, you can only dive 45 minutes uh, per day during what's called slack top tide, right? When is when the the tide stops going in or out, and that's the only time that you can die. And they found the car the last ten or fifteen minutes of that time, and um, but this time when we go back, we're gonna thoroughly search that what's left of that hull of that car. You okay, friend? I mean, friend, I want to thank you for coming on the channel and sharing this horrific experience with my viewers. And I hope you guys um send her, you know, when you when you guys you guys can leave a comment on this channel, it goes right to her. She's She's got the password. I've been answering. I've she, been answering all the so all the comments, and I please. thank you so much for all your participation and and right. your Everybody. caring. Thank you so much for your caring because no, please. nobody has given a shit. Not the cops. Not the state police. I go to missing persons day. They they ignore me like I'm not even there. And then when I call to talk to the cops, they tell me they're going to do all this stuff, and nobody does anything. So. Thank you so much for caring. And, and your comments mean so much to me because I get to see what other people think besides myself. A lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of my viewers send comments and you can tell it comes from the heart. There's, we, we got, I mean, right after we post, you know, you guys are going to probably see this Wednesday. I'll put this one up. We just put one up today. And I, I just want to thank you again, Fran, for uh, sharing something so personal private it doesn't get any more personal or private than telling a story that your brother and uncle murdered my father i mean it doesn't this is just mind-blowing the story hasn't ended friends got some more stories that we're going to be talking about so now you know the two people on the jersey side we need to know who was on the on the brooklyn side that was involved in this salvatore vitale why don't you tell us a little bit more about if you can do it anonymously and say, okay, where you picked it, the, the corpse up, where, where you got it, what car was it in? And was it Joey Bikini shop in Queens that you took it to? Because that was really the Mayo's hangout. Okay. Uh, is Kevin, there any thank you so much for letting well, me you. get this story out. Thank you. Thank you. And um, don't forget, please like and subscribe. You can't get content like this anywhere else. I, I mean, I, I said it once, I said it twice, I said it a hundred times. Thank you guys, and um, we'll see you. Thank you so much, friend. We'll see you guys on the next one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.